from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Cube conversation. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Cube, and we're going to have a conversation to really try to explore: Does infrastructure matter? You hear a lot today, oh, I've, ever since I've been in this business, I've heard, oh, infrastructure is dead, hardware is dead, but we're going to explore that premise, and with me is Randy Arsenault and Steve Keniston. They're both global market development execs at IBM. Guys, thanks for coming in, and let's riff. Thanks for having us, on this Dave. Thanks, Dave. So here's what I want to do. I want to start with data. We were just uh, recently at the MIT Chief Data Officer event. 10 years ago, that role didn't even exist. Mm. Now, data is everything. So I want to start it off with, you hear this bromide, data is the new oil. And we've said, you know what? Data actually is more valuable than oil. Oil I can put in my car, I can put in my house, but I can't put it in both. Data is, it doesn't follow the laws of scarcity. I can use the same data multiple times. And I can copy it, and I can find new value, I can cut cost, I can raise revenue. So data, in, in some respects, is more valuable. What do you think, Randy? Yeah, I would agree, and I think it's also, to your point, kind of a renewable resource, right? So, so data has the ability to be reused regularly, to be repurposed. So I would take it even further. We've been talking a lot lately about this whole concept that data is really evolving into its own tier. So if you think about a traditional infrastructure model where you've got sort of compute and network and applications and workloads, and on the edge you've got various consumers and producers of that data, the data itself, as those pieces have evolved, the data has been evolving as well. It's becoming more complicated. It's becoming certainly larger and more voluminous. It's better instrumented. It carries much more metadata. It's typically more proximal with code and compute. So the data itself is evolving into its own tier in a sense. So we, we believe that we want to treat data as a tier. We want to manage it, protect it wrap the services around it that enable it to reach its maximum potential in a sense. So guys, let's, if we want to make this interactive in a way, and I'd love to give you my opinions as well if Please. you guys are okay with that, but, but so I want to make an observation, Steve. If you take a look at the top five companies in terms of market cap in the US, uh, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and of course Microsoft, which is now over a trillion dollars, they're all data companies. They've surpassed the banks, the insurance companies, the, the Exxon Mobiles of the world as the most valuable companies in the world. What are your thoughts on that? Why is that? I, I think it's interesting, but I think it goes back to your original statement about <clears throat> data being the new oil. The, the, and unlike oil, right, you said you can, you can put it in your house, but you can't put it in your car. It also, when it's burnt, it's gone, right? But with data, you, you, you have it around, you generate more of it, you keep using it, and the more you use it and the more value you get out of it, the more value the company gets out of it. And so, as those, the, the reason why they continue to grow in value is because they continue to collect data and they continue to leverage that data for intelligent purposes to make user experiences better, uh, their business better, uh, to be able to go faster, to be able to do new, new things faster. It's all part of, uh, part of this growth. So data is one of the superpowers. The other superpower, of course, is machine intelligence or what everybody talks about as AI. You know, it used to be that processing power doubling every 18 months was what drove innovation in the industry. Today, it's a combination of data, which we have a lot of, it's AI and cloud for scale. And we're going to talk about cloud, but I want to spend a minute talking about AI. When I first came into this business, AI was all the rage, but we didn't have the amount of data that we had today. We, don't, we didn't have the processing power it was too expensive to store all this data. That's all changed. So now we have this emerging machine intelligence layer being used for a lot of different things, but it's sort of sitting on top of all these workloads. It's being injected into databases and applications. It's being used to detect fraud, to sell us more stuff you know, in real time, uh, to save lives, and, and we're going to talk about that, but it's one of these superpowers that really needs new hardware architectures. Uh, so, I, I want to explore machine intelligence mm -hmm. a little bit. It really is a game changer, isn't it? It really is, and, and, and tying back to the first point about sort of the, the evolution of data and the importance of data, things like machine learning and adaptive infrastructure and cognitive infrastructure have driven, to your point, a hard requirement to adapt and improve 
the infrastructure upon which that lives and runs and operates and moves and breathes. So we always had um, hardware evolution or development or, or improvements in networks and the basic you know, components of the infrastructure being driven again by advances in material science and silicon, et cetera. Well, now what's happening is the growth and importance and, and dynamicity of data is far outpacing the ability of the physical sciences to keep pace, right? That's a reality that we live in. So therefore, things like you know, cognitive computing, machine learning, AI, are, are kind of bridging the gap almost between the limitations we're bumping up against in physical infrastructure and the immense unlocked potential of data. So that intermediary is really where this phenomenon of AI and machine learning and deep learning is happening. And you're also correct in pointing out that it's it's everywhere. I mean, it's imbuing every single workload. It's transforming every industry at a fairly blistering pace. IBM's been front and center around artificial intelligence and cognitive computing since the beginning. Uh, we have a really interesting perspective on it, and I think we bring that to a lot of the solutions that we offer as well. Ginny Rometty, uh, a couple years ago, actually used the term incumbent disruptors. And when I think of that, I think about uh, artificial intelligence, and I think about companies like the ones I mentioned before that are very valuable, they have data at their core. Most incumbents don't, they have data all over the place. You know, they might have a bottling plant at the core, the manufacturing plant, or some human process at the core. Um, so, to close that gap, artificial intelligence, me, me, from, from the incumbent standpoint, is they're going to buy that from companies like IBM. They're going to, you know, procure Watson or other AI tools. and. You know, or maybe you know, use open source AI tools, but they're going to then figure out how to apply those to their business to do whatever, fraud detection or recommendation engines, or maybe even improve security. And we're going to talk about this in detail, but Steve, there's, there's got to be new infrastructure behind that. We can't run these new workloads on infrastructure that was designed 30, 40 years ago. Exactly, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I am truly fascinated by, with this growth of data, it's now getting more exponential, and why we think about why is it getting more exponential, it's getting more exponential because the ease at which you can actually now take advantage of that data is going beyond the big financial services companies, the big healthcare companies, right? We're moving further and further and further towards the edge where people like you and I, mm -hmm. and Randy and I have talked about the maker uh, economy, right? I, I want to be able to go in and, and, and build something on my own and then deliver it to either as a service as a person, a new application, or as a service to my infrastructure team to go then turn it on and, 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 and make something out of that. That infrastructure, it's got to come down in cost, but all the things that you said before, performance, reliability, mm -hmm. speed to get there, intelligence about data movement, uh, how do we get smarter about those things? All of the underlying ways we used to think about how we manage, protect, secure that it, it all has evolved and it's, it's continuing to evolve. Everybody talks about the journey, the journey to cloud, why does that matter? It's not just the cloud, it's, it's also the, the componentry underneath and it's got to go much broader, much bigger, much faster. Well, and, and I would just add, uh, just to amplify what Steve said about this whole maker movement, one of the other pressures that that's putting on corporate IT is it's driving, essentially driving product development and innovation out to the end, to the very edge, to the end user level. So you have all these very smart people who are developing these amazing new services and applications and workloads. When it gets to the point where they believe it can add value to the business, they then hand it off to IT, who is tasked with figuring out how to implement it, scale it, protect it, secure it, et cetera. That's really where I believe IBM plays a key role or where we can play a key role and add a lot of value is we understand that process of taking that from inception to scale and implementation in a secure enterprise way. And I want to come back to that. Uh, so we talked about data as one of the superpowers and, and AI, and the third one is cloud. So again, it used to be processor speed, now it's data plus AI and cloud. Why is cloud important? Because cloud enables scale. There's so much innovation going on in cloud. But I want to talk about you know, cloud 1.0 versus cloud 2.0. Uh, IBM uh, talks about you know, the new era of, of cloud. So what was cloud 1.0? It was largely lift and shift. It was taking a lot of crap locations and putting them in the public cloud. Uh, it was a lot of test and dev, mm -hmm. a lot of startups who said, hey, I don't need to you know, have, have IT. <laughs> like us, like theCUBE, we have no IT. Um, so it's great for small companies. Um, a, a, a great way to experiment and fail fast and, and pay for, you know, buy the drink. Mm -hmm. That was 1.0. Cloud 2.0 is, is, is emerging is different. It's hybrid 
It's multi-cloud, it's massively distributed systems. Distributed data on-prem in many, many clouds. Uh, and it's a whole new way of looking at infrastructure and systems design. So, as Steve, as you and I have talked about, it's programmable, so it's the API economy. Very low latency, we're going to talk more about what that means, but that concept of shipping code to data wherever, to, wherever it lives and making that cloud experience across the entire infrastructure, no matter whether it's on-prem or in cloud A, B, or C. It's a complicated problem. It, it really is, and when you think about the fact that, <clears throat> you know, the big the big challenge we started to, to run into when we were talking about cloud 1.0 was shadow IT, right? So folks really wanted to be able to move faster, and they were taking data, and they were actually copying it to these different locations to be able to use it for them uh, simply and easily. Well, once you broke that mold, you started getting away from the security and the corporate governance that was required to make sure that the business was safe, right? It, but, it, but, it, but following the rules, slowed business down, so this is why they continued to do it. In cloud 2.0, and I, I like the way you position this, right, is the fact that I no longer want to move data around. Moving data within the infrastructure is the most expensive thing to do in the data center. So if I can move code to where I need to be able to work on it, to, to get my answers, to do my AI, to do my intelligent learning, um, that all of a sudden brings a lot more value and a lot more speed, and speed is, time is money, right? If I can get it done faster, I, 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 I get more value out of it. And, and just, you know, people often talk about moving data, but you're right on. You, the last thing you want to do is move data. And, and just think about how long it takes to back up. The first time you ever backed up your iPhone, how long it took. Well, and that's relatively small compared to all the data in a, in a data center. There's another subtext here um, from a standpoint of cloud 2.0, and it involves the edge. The edge is this kind of new thing. Um, and we have a belief inside of, of Wikibon and theCUBE that we talk about all the time that a lot of the inference is going to be done at the edge. What does that mean? It means you're going to have factory devices, autonomous vehicles, medical device equipment that's going to have intelligence in there with new types of processors, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but a lot of the, the inferences, the conclusions will be made real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, these machines will be able to talk to each other, so you'll have machine-to-machine -machine communication. No humans need to be involved to actually make a decision as to where should I turn, uh, or you know, what should be the next move on the factory floor. So th the, again, a lot of the data is going to stay in place. Now what does that mean for IBM? You still have an opportunity to have data hubs mm -hmm. that collect that data, analyze it, maybe push it up to the cloud, develop models, iterate, and push it back down. But the edge is a fundamentally new type of approach that we've really not seen before, and it brings in a whole ton of new data. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, and, it, and it's a market phenomenon that has moved and is very rapidly moving from smartphones to the enterprise, right? So, right. so your point is well taken. If you look at the fact, as we talked about earlier, that compute is now proximal to the data as opposed to the other way around, and the emergence of things like mesh networking and you know, high bandwidth local communications, peer-to-peer -peer communications, it's, it's not only changing the physical infrastructure model and the, and the best practices around how to implement that infrastructure, it's also fundamentally changing the way you buy them the way you consume them, the way you charge for them. So it's, it's, that shift is changing and having a ripple effect across our industry in every sense, whether it's from the financial perspective, the operational perspective, the time to market perspective. It's also, and we talk a lot about industry transformation and, and disruptors that show up you know, in an industry, Uber being the most obvious example, and just gut an industry from the, from the bare metal and recreate it, they are able to do that because they've mastered this new environment where the data is king, how you exploit that data cost effectively, repeatably, efficiently is what differentiates you from the pack and allows you to create a brand new business model that, that didn't exist prior. So that's really where every other industry is going. You talk about those 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 big five companies in, in uh, North America that are that are the top top companies now because of data. I often think about rewind, you know, twenty five years. Do you think Amazon, when they built Amazon, really thought they were going to be in the food service business, the, the video surveillance business, the drone business, all these other the book business, right? Maybe the book business, right? But but who? 
their architecture had to scale and change and evolve with where that's going all around the data because then they can use these data components in all these other places to get smarter, bigger, and grow faster. And that's, that's why they're one of the top five. So this is a really important point, especially for the young people in our audience. So it used to be that if you were in an industry, if you were in healthcare, or you were in financial services, or you were in manufacturing, you were in that business for life. Every industry had its own stack the sales, the marketing, the R&D, everything was wired to that industry and that industry domain expertise was really not portable across businesses. Because of data and because of digital transformations, companies like Amazon can get into content, they can get into music, they can get into financial services, they can get into healthcare, they can get into grocery. It's all about that data model being portable across those industries, it's a very powerful concept that you would well, introduce. And I mean, IBM owns the weather company, right? So I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a million examples of traditional businesses that have developed ways to either enter new markets or expand their footprint in existing markets by leveraging new sources of data. So you think about a retailer or a, or a wholesale distributor, they have to very accurately or as accurately as possible forecast demand for goods and make sure logistically the goods are in the right place at the right time. Well, there are a million factors that go into that. There's weather, there's population density, there's local cultural phenomena, there's all sorts of things that have to be taken into consideration. Previously, that would be near impossible to do. Now, you can sit down, again, as an individual maker, I can sit down at my desk and I can craft a model that consumes data from five readily available public APIs or data sets to enhance my forecast, and I can then create that model, execute it, and give it to, to, uh, to a, my IT guy to go scale out. Okay, so I want to start getting into the infrastructure conversation. Again, remember, the premise of this conversation is does inter infrastructure matter? We want, to, we want to explore that. I want to start at the high level with, with, with cloud, multi-cloud specifically. We said cloud 2.0 is about hybrid multi-cloud. I'm going to make a statement, so if you guys chime in. My, my assertion is that multi-cloud has largely been a symptom of multi-vendor. Shadow IT, different developers, different workloads, different lines of business, saying, hey, we want to, we want to do stuff in the cloud. It's happened so many times in the IT business. All, and then, who's going to govern it? How is this going to be secure? Who's got access control? On and on and on. What about compliance? What about security? Then they throw it over to IT and they say, hey, help us fix this. And so IT has said, look, we need a strategy around multi-cloud, it's horses for courses. Maybe we go cloud A for our collaboration software, cloud B for the cognitive stuff, cloud C for the you know, cheap and, and, and deep storage. Different workloads for different clouds, and, and, but there's got to be a strategy around that. So I think that's kind of point number one, and IT is being asked to kind of clean up this stuff. But the future, today, it's the, the clouds are loosely coupled. There may be a network that connects them, but there's, there's not a really good way to take data, or, or uh, uh, rather, to take code, ship it to data, mm -hmm. wherever it lives, and have it be a consistent, what you were talking about, an enterprise data plane. That's emerging, and that's kind of really where the opportunity is. And then you maybe move into the control plane and the management piece of it, and then bring in the edge. But envision this mesh of, of, of clouds, if you will, whether it's on-prem or in the public cloud or some kind of hybrid, where you can take metadata and code, ship it to wherever the data is, leave it there. Much smaller, you know, ship five megabytes of code to a petabyte of data, as opposed to waiting three months to try to ship, you know, petabytes to, over the network, it's not going to work. So that's kind of the, the spectrum of multi-cloud, loosely coupled today, going to this, you know, tightly coupled mesh. Your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, and, and I would add to it, or expand it even further to say that it's also driving behavioral, fundamental behavioral and organizational challenges within a lot of organizations and, and large enterprises. Cloud and this multi-cloud proliferation that you spoke about, one of the other things that's done that we talk about, but probably not enough, is it's almost created this inversion situation where in the past you'd have the business saying to IT, I need this, I need this supply chain application, I need this vendor relationship database, I need this order processing system. Now, with the emergence of this cloud and, and how easy it is to consume and how cost effective it is, now you've got the IT guys and the engineers and the designers and the architects and the data scientists pushing ideas to the business. Hey, we can expand our footprint and our reach dramatically if we do this. So you get this much more bi-directional conversation happening now, 
which frankly a lot of traditional companies are still working their way through, which is why you don't see you know 100% cloud adoption everywhere. But it drives those very productive full duplex conversations at a level that we've never seen before. And I mean, we encounter clients every day who are having these discussions, are sitting down across the table, and IT is not just doesn't just have a seat at the table, they are often driving the go-to-market strategy. So that's a really interesting transformation that we see as well, in addition to the technology. Yeah. So, so there are some amazing things happening, Steve, underneath the covers and the plumbing and infrastructure. And look at, we think infrastructure matters, that's kind of why we're here, we're, we're infrastructure guys. Um, but I want to make a point. So for decades, this industry has marched to the cadence of Moore's Law, the idea that you can double processing speeds every 18 months. Disk drives, processors, disk drives, you know, they, they followed that curve. You could plot it out. The last 10 years, that started to attenuate. So what, what, what happened is, chip companies would start putting more cores mm -hmm. onto the real estate. Well, they're running out of real estate now. So now what's happening is we've seen this emergence of alternative processors. Largely came from mobile, Mm -hmm. Now you have ARM <clears throat> doing a lot of offload processing. A lot of the storage processing uh, that's getting offloaded, those are ARM processors. Uh, uh, in, NVIDIA with GPUs powering a lot, of, a lot of AIs. You're even seeing FPGAs, they're simple, they're easy to, to spin up. ASICs, you know, making a big comeback. So you're seeing these alternative processes, processors powering things underneath where the x86 is uh, and, and of course they're still running applications on x86. So that's one sort of big thing, big change in infrastructure to support this distributed systems. The other is flash. We saw flash basically take out spinning disk for all high speed applications. We're seeing the elimination of SCSI, which is a protocol that sits in between the, the, the disk you know, and the rest of the network. That's, that's going away. You're, you're hearing things like NVMe, and, and Rocky and PCIe, basically allowing storage to directly talk to the processor. So now envision, envision this multi-cloud system where you want to ship metadata and code anywhere. Mm -hmm. These high speed capabilities, interconnects, low latency protocols are what sets that up. So there's technology underneath this, and obviously IBM is you know, an inventor of a lot of this stuff, um, that is really going to power this next generation of workloads. Your comments? Yeah, I think I think all that 100% true, and I think the one component that we're feeding a little bit about, of, even in the infrastructure, is the infrastructure software. Right? There's hardware. We talked a lot. You know, you talked about a lot of hardware components that are definitely evolving to get us better, stronger, faster, more secure, more reliable, and that sort of thing. And then there's also infrastructure software, so not just the application databases or that, or that sort of thing, but, but software to manage all this. And I think in a hybrid multi-cloud world, um, you know, you've got these multiple clouds. For, for all practical purposes, no way around it anymore, right? Marketing gets more value out of the Google analytic tools in Google's cloud, and developers get more value out of using the tools in AWS. They're going to continue to use that. At the end of the day, I as a business, though, need to be able to extract the value from all of those things in order to make different business decisions to be able to move faster and surface my clients better. There's hardware that's going to help me accomplish that, and then there are software things about managing that whole com set of componentry so that I can maximize the value across that entire stack, and that stack is multiple clouds, plus internal clouds, external clouds, everything. Yeah, so it's a great point, and, and you're seeing clear examples of companies investing in custom hardware. You see, mm -hmm. you know, Google has its own chip, Amazon has its own chip, IBM's got you know, Power9, uh, on and on. But none of this stuff works if you can't manage it. So right. I talked before about programmable infrastructure. We talked about the data plane and the control plane. That's software that's going to allow us to actually manage these multiple clouds as at least a quasi single entity, you know, something like a logical entity. Certainly within workload classes and in Nirvana across the entire you know, network. Well, and, and, and the principle or, or one of the principal drivers of that evolution, of course, is containerization, right? So, the containerization phenomenon, and, and you know, obviously with our acquisition of Red Hat, we're now very keenly aware and acutely plugged into the whole containerization phenomenon, which is great. We're, you're seeing that becoming almost the, um, I can't think of a, a good metaphor, but you're seeing containerization become the vernacular that's being spoken 
in multiple different types of reference architectures and use case environments that are vastly different in their characteristics. Whether they're high throughput, low latency, whether they're large volume, whether they're edge specific, whether they're more you know, consolidated or hub and spoke models, containerization is becoming the standard by which those architectures are being developed and with which they're being deployed. So we think we're very well positioned working with that emerging trend and that rapidly developing trend to instrument it in a way that makes it easier to deploy, easier to instrument, easier to develop. So that's key and, and I, I want to sort of focus now on the relevance of IBM. Mm -hmm. uh, Can I just tie, oh, please, yeah. I just want to tie one thing that Raymond was saying. Because that, that whole containerization thing, back to your original point, Dave, about moving data being very expensive and the fact that the fact that you want to move code out to the data, now with containers, microservices, all of that stuff gets a lot easier, development becomes a lot faster, and you're actually pushing the speed of business faster. Well, and, and the other key point is, we talked about moving code you know, to the data. As you move the code to the data and run applications anywhere, wherever the data is, using containers, the Kubernetes, et cetera, you don't have to test it. It's going to run, you know, assuming you have the standard infrastructure in place to do that and the software to manage it. That's huge because that means business agility, it means better quality and you know, speed. All right, let's talk about IBM. The world is complex. This stuff is not trivial. The, 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 the more clouds we have, the more edge we have, the more data we have, the more complex it gets. And IBM happens to be very good at complex. Um, three components of the innovation cocktail, data, AI, and cloud. Mm -hmm. IBM, your customers have a lot of data. You guys are good with data. It's a very strong analytics business. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, you've invested a lot in Watson. Um, that's a key component of your business. And cloud, you have a cloud. Mm -hmm. um, it's not designed to compete, knock, knock heads on the race to zero with, with the cheap and deep you know, storage clouds. It's designed to really run workloads and applications, but you've got all three ingredients. As well, you're going hard after the multi-cloud world. For you guys, mm -hmm. you've got infrastructure underneath. You've got hardware and software to manage that infrastructure, all the modern stuff that we've talked about. That's what's going to power uh, the customer's digital transformations, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but maybe you could expand on that in terms of IBM's relevance. Sure, so, so again, using the kind of maker, the maker economy metaphor, bridging from that, you know, individual level of innovation and creativity and development to a broadly distributed, you know, globally available workload or, or information source of some kind. The process of, of, of that bridge is about scale and reach. How do you scale it so that it runs effectively, optimally, is easily managed, all looks and feels the same, falls under the common umbrella of services, and then how do you get it to as many endpoints as possible, whether it's individuals or entities or agencies or whatever, scale and reach. IBM is all about scale and reach. I mean, that's kind of our stock and trade. We, we are able to take solutions from small, kind of departmental level or, or kind of skunk works level and make them large, secure, repeatable, easily managed services. Um, and, and make them as turnkey as possible. Our services organization's been doing it for decades, exceptionally well. Our product portfolio supports that. You, you talked about Watson and kind of the cognitive uh, computing story. We've been a thought leader in this space for decades. I mean, we, we didn't just arrive on the scene two years ago when machine learning and deep learning and IoT started to become prominent and say, this sounds interesting, we're going to plant our flag here. We've been there. We've been there for a long time. So, you know, I kind of, from an infrastructure perspective, I kind of like to use the analogy that, you know, we, the, our whole technology ethos is built on AI. It's built on cognitive computing and, and sort of adaptive computing. Every one of our portfolio products is imbued with that same capability. So we use it internally. We're kind of built from AI for AI. So maybe that's the answer to this question, but so what do, you, what do you say to somebody who says, well, you know, I want to buy you know, my flash storage from Pure, I want to buy my database from Oracle, I want to buy my you know, Intel servers from Dell, you know, whatever, and I want to, I want to, I want to control them, and, 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 and I got to go build it my, myself. Why should I work with IBM? Do you, do you get that a lot, and how do you respond to that, Steve? I think, I think this whole new data economy has opened up a lot of places for data to be stored anywhere. 
I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to management. And one of the things that I was thinking about as you guys were, were conversing is the enterprise class or enterprise uh, need for things like security and protection and that sort of thing that rounds out the software stack in our portfolio. Um, one of the things we can bring to the table is sure, you can buy piece parts and componentry from, from different people that you want, right? And in that whole notion around fail fast, sure you can get some new things that might be a little bit faster, that might be, might be here first, but one of the things that IBM takes a lot of pride and puts a lot of qual uh, t uh, thing, uh, a lot of pride into is, is the quality of their their delivery of, of both hardware and software, right? So, so to me, even though the inf the infrastructure does matter quite a bit, the question is 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 how much and to what degree. So, when you look at our core clients, the global two thousand, right? They want to fail fast. They want to fail fast securely. They want to fail fast and make sure they're protected. They want to fail fast to make sure they're not accidentally giving away the keys to the kingdom. At the end of the day, a lot of the large vendor, a lot of the large um, clients that we have need to be able to protect their their IP, their brain trust, their, but also need the flexibility to be creative and create new applications to gain new customer bases. So the way I the way I look at it, and when I talk to clients and when I talk to, to folks, is is we want to give them that while also making sure they're, they're protected and secure. Now, that, that said, I would just add that, that and 100% accurate depiction, the data economy is really changing the way, not only infrastructure is deployed and designed, but the way it can be. I mean, it's opening up possibilities that didn't exist and there's new ones cropping up every day. Um, to your point, if you want to go kind of best of breed or you want to have a solution that includes multi-vendor solutions, that's okay. I mean, the, the whole idea of using, again, for instance, containerization, thinking about Kubernetes and, and Docker, for instance, as a, as a protocol standard or a platform standard across heterogeneous hardware, that's fine. Like, like, we will still support that environment. We believe there are significant additive advantages to, to looking at IBM as a full solution or a full stack solution provider, and our largest, you know, most mission critical application clients are doing that. Um, so we think we can tell a pretty compelling story, and I would just finally add that we also often see situations where in the journey from the kind of maker to the largely deployed enterprise class workload, there's a lot of pitfalls along the way, and there's companies that will occasionally, you know, bump into one of them and come back six months later and say, okay, we, we encountered some scalability issues, some security issues. Let's talk about how we can develop a new architecture that solves those problems without sacrificing any of our advanced right. capabilities. All right, let's talk about what this means for customers. So everybody talks about digital transformation and digital business. So what's the difference between a business and a digital business? It's how they use data. In order to leverage data to become one of those incumbent disruptors, using Ginny's term, you've got to have a modern infrastructure. If you want to build this multi-cloud, you know, connection point enterprise data pipeline, to use your term, Randy, you've got to have modern infrastructure to do that, that's low latency, that allows me to ship data to code, that allows me to run applications anywhere, leave the data in place, including the edge, and really close that gap between those top five data you know, value companies and yourselves. Now, the other piece of that is, you don't want to waste a lot of time and money managing infrastructure. You've got to have intelligence infrastructure, you've got to use modern infrastructure, and you've got to redeploy those labor assets toward higher value, more productive for the company activities. So, we all know, IT labor is a, a choke point. Mm -hmm. and, and we spend more on IT labor, managing LUNs, provisioning servers, tuning databases, all that stuff. That's got to change in order for you to fund digital transformations. So that, to me, is the big takeaway as to what it means for customers. And, and we talk about that, sorry, we talk about that all the time, and specifically in the context of the enterprise data pipeline, and within that pipeline, kind of the newer generation machine learning, deep learning, cognitive workload uh, phases. The data scientists who are involved at various stages along the process are obviously kind of scarce resources. They're very expensive. So you can't afford for them to be burning cycles managing environments, you know, spinning up VMs and moving data around and creating working sets and enriching metadata. They, they, that's not the best use of their time. So we've developed a portfolio of solutions specifically designed to optimize them as a resource, as a very valuable resource. So um, I would vehemently agree with your premise. We talk about the rise of the infrastructure developer, right? So at the end of the day, 
Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought this topic up because it's not just customers, it's personas. P IBM talks to different personas within our client base or our prospect base about why is this infrastructure important to, to them? And one of the core components is skill, Dave. You have, uh, when we talk about this rise of the infrastructure developer, what we mean is, I need to be able to build composable, intelligent, programmatic infrastructure that I as IT can set up, not have to worry about a lot of risk about it breaking and have to do a lot of troubleshooting, but turn the keys over to the users now. Let them use the infrastructure in such a way that helps them get their job done better, faster, stronger, but still keeps the business protected. So don't make copies into production and screw stuff up there, but if I want to make a copy of the data, feel free, go ahead, and put it in a place that's safe and secure and it won't, it won't get stolen, and it also won't bring down the enterprise as it's trying to do its business. Very key, key uh, components to, we talk about AI-infused data protection, AI-infused storage. At the end of the day, it's what is an AI-infused data center, right? It needs to be an intelligent data center and I don't have to spend a lot of time doing it. The new IT person doesn't want to be troubleshooting all day long. They want to be in looking at things like ARM, NVMe, what's that going to do for my business to make me more competitive? That's where IT wants to be focused. Yeah, and, and um, it's also, it, it, just to kind of again build on this, this whole idea, th we haven't talked a lot about it, but there's obviously a cost element to all this, right? I mean, you know, Enterprises are still very cost conscious and they're still trying to manage budgets and, and they don't have an unlimited amount of capital resources. So things like the ability to do fractional consumption, so buy you know pa paper drink, right? Buy small bits of infrastructure and deploy them as you need. And also, to, to Steve's point, and this is really Steve's kind of area of expertise and, and where he's a, a thought leader is, kind of data efficiency. You, you also can't afford to have copy sprawl, excessive data movement, poor production schemes, slow recovery times and recall times. You've got to, as, especially as data volumes are ramping you know, geometrically, the, the efficiency piece and the cost piece is absolutely relevant. And that's another one of the things that often gets lost in translation between kind of the maker level and the deployment level. So I wanted to, um, do a little thought exercise for those of you who think that this is all, you know, bromide and BS. Um, cloud 2.0 is also about we're moving from a world of, of remote cloud services to one where you have this mesh, which is ubiquitous, of, of digital services. You talked about intelligence, Steve, you know, the intelligent data center. So all these, all these digital services, what am I talking about? AI blockchain, 3D printing, autonomous vehicles, edge computing, quantum, RPA, and all the other things in the Gartner hype cycle, you'll be able to procure these as services. They're part of this mesh. Mm -hmm. So here's the thought exercise. When do you think that owning and driving your own vehicle is no longer going to be the norm? Right? Interesting thesis okay. question. Why answer you, if you why, like. Why do you ask the question? Well, because these are some of the disruptions. So the questions are designed to get you thinking about the potential disruptions. You know, is it possible that our children's children aren't going to be driving their own car? It's, 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 a, it's a cultural change. When I was 16 years old, I, I couldn't wait. But you're starting to see a shift there. Quasi-autonomous vehicles, it's all sort of the rage. Personally, I don't think they're quite ready yet, but it's on the horizon. Okay, I'll give you another one. When will machines be able to make better diagnoses than doctors? Uh, actually, both of those are, so, so let's, let's hit on autonomous and, and self-driving vehicles first. Uh, I agree, that they're not there yet. I will say that um, we have a, a pretty thriving business practice and, and competency around working with ADOS providers. And, and there's an interesting perception that ADOS, uh, autonomous driving, um, uh, projects are like there's, okay, there's 10 of them around the world, right? Maybe, there's 10 meta-level ADOS projects around the world. What people often don't see is there is a gigantic ecosystem building around ADOS. All the data sourcing, all the telemetry, all the hardware, all the network support, all the services, I mean, building around this is phenomenal and it's growing at a, at a ridiculous rate. So we're very hooked into that. We see tremendous growth opportunities there. Um, if I had to guess, I would say within 10 to 12 years, there will be functionally capable, viable autonomous vehicles. Not everywhere, but they will be, you will be able as a consumer 
to purchase one. Yeah, that's good. Okay, and, and so that's good, I, I agree. That's a t the timeline is not you know, within the next three to five years. Yeah. All right, how about retail stores? Will, will retail stores largely disappear? <laughs> where, where were, Randy and I were just someplace the other day and I said, didn't there used to be a brick and mortar there? And, and, and it's yeah. not, oh, we were, well, we were walking through the Cambridge side Galleria, right. and now the third floor, there's no more stores, right? Up there is going to be all offices. They've shrunk it down to just two floors of stores. Mm -hmm. And I highly believe that it's because, you know, the brick, you know, the, uh, the retailers online are, are doing so well. I mean, think about, it used to be tricky, and how do you get in, and, and, and I need the Walmart mentality, go, go, go get with Amazon, and that became very difficult. Look at places like Bombas, or Casper, or all the luggage plate, all this little individual uh, boutique, selling online, selling quickly, never having to have to open up a store, speed of deployment, speed of product, I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal now. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, if, if Amazon could and, and they're investing billions of dollars and they're trying to solve the last mile problem. If Amazon could figure out a way to deliver 95% of their product catalog, Prime, within four to six hours, Game brick on. and mortar stores would literally disappear within a month. And I think that's a factual statement. <laughs> okay, I'll give you another one. Will banks lose control, traditional banks lose control of the payment systems. You use Venmo, Zelle, you see the banks are smart, they're buying up yeah. you know, fintech companies, but right, these are entrenched. Yeah, that, that's businesses. another one That's another one with an interesting uh, philosophical element to it, because people, and, and some of it's generational, right? Like our parents' generation would be horrified by the thought of taking a picture of a check or using blockchain or some kind of a fintech payment Morning service. Bitcoin. Right. Bitcoin. <laughs> or any kind of, yeah, exactly. You guys own Bitcoin? My, I do, my dad asked me You own Bitcoin? That. I do. I own Bitcoin too. Um, we're hip. So we're hip. We're our, broke, but we're, hip. Yeah. we're old <laughs> and we're hip. But we're, we're waiting it out though, it's fine. Right. By the way, I just wanted to mention that we, we don't hang out in the mall, it's actually right across the street from our office. <laughs> I wanted to just add that to the previous comment. So. Um, there is a philosophical piece of it though. Like our generation, we're, we're fairly comfortable now because we've grown up in a sense with these technologies being adopted. Our, our children, the concept of going to a bank for them will be foreign. I mean, it will make, they'll have no context for the context, for the, the, the process of going to speak face to face to another human. It just, it won't exist. Yeah. Will, will, will automation, whether it's robotic process automation, other automation, uh, 3D printing, will that begin to swing the pendulum back to onshore manufacturing? Maybe tariffs will help too. <laughs> but, but, but again, the idea that machine intelligence increasingly will disrupt businesses, there's no industry that's safe from disruption because of the data context that we talked about before. Randy and I put together a, uh, uh, you know, IBM loves to use big words, transformation, agile. And as a sales rep, you're in the field and you're trying to think about, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean for me to explain to my customer? So we put together this whole thing about what does transformation mean? One of them was the taxi service, right? And the other, another one was retail. So you, another one was, was FinServe. I mean, you're, you're hitting on, on all the core things, right? But this transformation, I mean, it goes so deep and so wide. When you think about exactly what Randy had said before about Uber just transforming just the taxi business, retailers and taxis now and uh, hotel chains and that sort of thing, the know your customer, they're getting all of that from data. Data that I'm putting in, not that they're doing work to extract out of me that I'm putting in. So that autonomous vehicle comes to pick up Steve Keniston. It knows that Steve likes iced coffee on his way to work, gives me a coupon on a screen, I hit the button, it automatically stops at Starbucks for me and it pre-ordered it for me. You're talking about that whole ecosystem wrapped around just autonomous vehicles and data now? It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and we're not far off from the Minority Report era of like anthropomorphic advertising targeted at an individual in real time. I mean, that's going to happen. It's almost there now. I mean, you, to Steve's point, you will get, if I walk into Starbucks, my phone says, hey, why don't you use some points while you're here, Randy? You know, <laughs> so, so that's happening. And facial think, recognition, I mean, yep. it's, all, it's all coming together. So, and again, underneath all this is infrastructure. So infrastructure mm -hmm. clearly matters. If you don't have the infrastructure to power these new workloads, you're in trouble. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, and I, I think we're all in agreement on that, and, and, and from, from my perspective, from an IBM perspective, through my eyes, I would say, we're increasingly being viewed as kind of an arms dealer, and that's a, probably a horrible analogy, but we're being, used, we're being viewed as a supplier to the providers of those services, right? So we provide the raw materials and the machinery and the tooling 
that enables those innovators to create those new services and do it quickly, securely, reliably, repeatably, at a, at a reasonable cost, right? So it's, it's a step back from direct engagement with, consumer, with, with customers and clients and, and uh, architects, but that's where our whole industry is going, right? We are increasingly more abstracted from the end consumer. We're dealing with the, the sort of assembly. We're dealing with the assemblers. You know, they take the pieces and assemble them and deliver the services. So we're not as often doing the assembly as we are providing the raw materials. Guys, great conversation. I think we set a record in terms of <laughs> in studio like that. So thank you very much for, no for coming Thanks, on. No problem. Thanks, Dave. And, yeah, this is great. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. You're watching theCUBE.